from the New York City area, welcome to the Badass Counseling Show, where the master badass himself, Sven Erlinson, takes you deep and gives balm for the soul, baby. Hello, hello, it's good to have you here. You have just found yourself uh, bumping into us here at the Badass Counseling Show. This is our podcast, and if you are watching us live at the minute uh, on YouTube or on TikTok or on Facebook, it's great to have you here. Um, or if you're watching us on YouTube where we keep everything up on video, great to have you here. Or if you're just listening in from anywhere around the world, it's super great to have you here. Uh, I am joined in studio today uh, by KC, that's a K and a C next to each other, KC over there in the booth, and Rob the Rocket right next to me. What say ye, young man? Good day, Sven. Um, we had a comment here. I do love me some Svenergy every day. Thank <laughs> you for all that you do. Wow. All right, Svenergy. Very love, sweet. Love yeah. Very sweet. Thank you for that. How are you, though, today, Rob? That was the I'm, question. I'm, I'm doing great. We are recording this um, a little earlier, but this particular episode will be available on Christmas Eve. So ho, 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 my friend. This is our Christmas Eve episode. It's uh, the drop on un- Christmas Eve. Gotcha. Unless you found us sooner on YouTube, where well, they drop right true. away and they come with video uncut. So yes. if you actually are hearing us but want to see our ugly faces, at least my ugly face, I have no idea why you would want to, and see all the gaffes that happen. Uh, It's all right there uncut on YouTube. All right. You, sir, are the master of time and space. Yeah, that's a bit of a stretch, but what the hell. All right. Can you talk about how a daughter, this is from Melissa. Can you talk about how a daughter can heal from impacts of being raised by a jealous mother? The problem of being raised by a jealous parent, one of the problems, of course, other than the fact that it hurts and you're being looked down upon while you're simultaneously or treated, you're being treated down, you're being treated poorly, um, undermined, potentially stolen from, uh, but you're not getting the attention you deserve. Rather, if someone is jealous, I'm trying to get what they have. I'm trying to steal their attention. Um, And so your needs weren't being met. So if you were, can I talk about uh, a daughter healing from the impacts of being raised by a jealous mother? Your mother, if she was jealous, presumably of you, uh, is implied in what you're saying. The underlying message is um, that you don't matter. Uh, Ironically, you did matter. She was trying to get what you had or be more like you or get your affection or your attention. Perhaps she was jealous of the attention your father gave to you or something, but your mother was jealous of you and the way, the underlying message is that who you really are doesn't matter. I, I don't like you, or I don't want you as you are. I want what you have or whatever. And so these underlying messages are what got stuck inside of you. And so you've got to begin, you've got to go down there and identify what the hell is it really? Is it that basically I was treated like a piece of shit? I believe I am a piece of shit. Your mom mistreated you. It's going down in there to identify what really are the fucking messages. And one of the questions I would ask you if we're in session is, what were you told about yourself? What are the literal things that would come out of your mother's mouth? What is the one, as far as your value or who you are, what is the one that resonates with you the very most? Um, and that would be the one that I would want to ask you because that's the one you need to get in there. You need to identify that. You need to flush out all the feelings that go with that, journaling that out, writing letters to your mom and so forth. And I would also want to ask you a a really hard question for a lot of people. And maybe the answer is zero, but I would want to ask you the question, how much do you hate your mom for how you were treated, for how she treated you, for what she did to you? Hate's a powerful one. And maybe you're going to say zero and I'd push you back and I'd say, "I'm, I'm not so sure I believe that because you were clearly treated poorly, but you have to get down into your real feelings. Because no doubt, if your mom was jealous of you and was likely thus mistreating you, which means it wasn't safe for your feelings. So you've got to get down and finally give your feelings the light of day. You've got to give yourself the safety to allow your feelings up and begin to feel all those things that you really felt back then and likely have still felt uh, since then deep down. Next question, this is by Kat. Can I help to build friendships and lean on people again? Can I help, uh, presumably yourself, can I help to build friendships and lean on people again? 
I'm going to do my best with that one because it's not totally clear to me, at least. I'm sure it's clear, but I'm just not getting the clarity of it. Um, can you begin to lean on people again and build friendships? Yes, you can. Uh, but what it requires, anytime you have a blockage between me and what I want to have or want to be doing, there, the, the blockage is always some fear. It's always some fear and fear of some sort of pain. So I would ask you in one sentence or less to identify for yourself and write down what precisely in one sentence or less is the thing you fear the most about having relationships again, about leaning on people again. And, and I'm willing to bet that the answer is the fear of getting hurt again, fear of them using it against you, fear of them not liking you. And so you have to journal on that more and more. You have to go down into those fears of what do I really fear and allowing that and facing that and then asking yourself, well, if I fear them, let's just say them not liking me, then ask yourself the question, if that happened, if that fear happened, that they walked away from me or they said, I don't like me, I don't like you, then what? Then what? Would you kill yourself? If that eventuality, and this is a tool you can use in anything, sort of looking at worst case scenario, if that worst case scenario happened, and this you can use this with anything, with losing your job or, or starting this business that I'm not sure about, or standing up to family, it can be anything. Looking at worst case scenario and asking yourself the question, then what? Would you kill yourself? And I always ask that question, I swear to God, I always ask that question. Would I kill myself if the worst case scenario happened? And if your answer is no, then I'd say, okay. So what you're telling me then is you would likely grieve if it happened and you would have all these feelings and you'd let your feelings out and grieve it out and get the feelings out. And then what? Go back to living, right? Yes, it would hurt. Yes, it would suck. I'm not disputing any of that. Yes, it would be painful, but you'd go back to living. In other words, even if the worst case scenario happened, I'll be okay. I'll be okay. And that's a powerful, powerful realization. Why? Because now we're no longer afraid or no longer anywhere near as afraid because we realize worst case scenario, I'll be okay. And now we can begin to take the path that we most desire to take rather than scaling it back and going tick, 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 and going 30 degrees in a different direction because it's not quite as scary. Once you no longer are near, anywhere near as afraid of the worst case, say, case scenario, once you can finally trust that I'll be okay, we become much more bold. We become much more willing to honor our own sense of self and our own needs and our own aspirations and feelings. All right, next question. Rob, if you got one there on YouTube, you look like you got a trigger, a itchy trigger finger there. I do, partner, and okay. I am the poet laureate of the Old West. All so, right. All right, here we go. Uh, how can I figure out what it is I'm called to do in a career? I'm currently very comfortable and don't feel fulfilled. I want to do something I'm passionate about, but feel lost. Uh-huh. Um, and, you know, it's it's funny that we, uh, this comes right after the question I just asked, um, because it's what you're fundamentally saying is, I, you know, I'm comfortable in my present career, but I want more. And more for you comes in the form of fulfillment and aliveness uh, and that sort of thing. And that's, boy, if you're going to aspire for anything, aliveness and feeling on fire is a great thing. And you can absolutely have that in your life. Um, and it's funny because a lot of people get blocked on this. And, it's, and to other people, it's funny that you don't know what your dream is. But there are, that's a really legitimate thing in life to not know what my dream is or to know not know what I'm passionate about. Um, and so then I, I would reverse engineer it. Just like uh, with the last question, I'd use the last question that I was just tinkering with, this whole notion of fear. And I would ask you this, what career path or passion path would scare you the most to do? What would scare you the most to do? Now, for me, it'd be professional rock climber, okay? Nothing would scare me more than that. Thank you very much, all right? But that doesn't really give me any hints because I'm, but, okay, so there's the type of scary as in just it would be scary, but then I want to tack on this. What would scare you the most yet simultaneously, wait for it, be the most exhilarating? What would be exhilarating, even if it weren't the most exhilarating? What would simultaneously be scary and exhilarating? 
What would be fun to just try, even knowing you didn't have to make a career out of it, but to try it for a year or to try it for six months as work? Or let me ask you this. If you didn't have to think about a particular job, and these are all questions you should be writing down. These are all questions you can use in your own journaling. Let me ask you this. If it weren't about a particular job, what's a field? Just pick a field. And it's so freaking funny that this question comes up today because I just made a video I'm going to be posting later today as a, on you know TikTok and, and social and, and Facebook, et cetera, on this exact thing. Or did I already put it up? Last week. No, I, anyway, um, it's, uh, sorry. Uh, you do 800, 900 of these videos and they tend to, you know, get jumbled around in my little melon. Um, don't pick a job, pick a field. Pick a field. What field looks interesting? Well, uh, maybe the field of like people. Great. That's, let's go, let's go wide. All right. Now, people like, serving people like, you know, wiping butts sort of thing or serving food or like selling to people or I don't know, I just like interacting with people. Okay, well, you, and we begin to whittle it down. Well, in what ways of working with people sound appealing? Well, I, you know, or uh, professions you admire or you've thought, oh, that might be fun, right? Within that field. So it's whittling down the field. You don't have to know the job. And this is something I tell the young people all the time. You don't have to know the job. Just get a feel for what field might be interesting. When my son uh, was going through and coming out of college, he says, you know, Pop, I, he said, you know, I was, you know, I can't play professional sports and whatever, but I just love being around sports. I, I love being around sports. I'd like to make a career out of sports. I said, fucking go for it. And uh, so he did. Started working in a down in Red Stick, down in Baton Rouge. Started working in a clothing goods store, or a, excuse me, a sporting goods store. And then I got a text uh, about nine months later, and he says, "Pop, I got it." It was his one dream job, the only, the only job he could get, and it was actually the dream company that would ever get him out of Louisiana because he loved it down there as a Minnesotan. And he and he ended up getting hired by the Minnesota Twins, and he went and worked for a major league baseball team for a bunch of years and now he works for a major US university in sports, in sports sales specifically, huge part of the job. You know, he's the one putting butts in the seats, making the money. Um, and, uh, but he's in sports and he loves it. My daughter has a passion for disaster relief management. And, and that way, I didn't even know that career existed. And that's her like passion. Now it's huge, of course. And, uh, and she's brilliant and that, she wanted the field. Just shit that looks interesting. Go find a field. And the jobs will reveal themselves. Shit, when my, when I was, when my son was 20, 22, do you think he knew every job possible in sports? No. But if you think about it, all the millions of jobs there are, different types of jobs, just around sports, there are so many different sports, not to mention there's broadcaster, there's agent, there's sales, there's, uh, I, I had a friend who was the turf technician or head lead turf guy at a major U.S. sporting complex. It's like, what a fucking cool job, man. I mean, hard work and shit, but you know, you get to work with the earth and soil and, and then fake turf and painting and all this shit. Anyway, that's enough for that question. Go with a field and then just get into it and start playing around. Play with it like a little boy plays with a bug. Play with it, play with it, play with it and let it open uh, itself up and unfold in front of you. All right, next question. One listener suggested stuntman. I like it. Why not? Do you know that there are, you may not know this, there are actually people who make a living as stunt persons. Of course there are. In Hollywood, lots of them. That's the point. And you'll get plenty of people saying, oh, you shouldn't do that. Oh, you can't make a living. Fuck them. It's your life. There actually are people who make a living who actually believed they could make a living and they went after it. And the beautiful part is, remember, you guys have heard me say this before, what my mother used to say for decades and decades, even right up until her death at 93, I remember she used to say, one of her favorite sayings is doors open, doors open, doors. And sometimes we have to walk through this door that looks appealing, not because we're gonna spend forever in that room, but because after whatever lapse of time, we're gonna recognize another small door at the other end of that room that leads down a stairway into an ante room where we're gonna be spending some time. And then at some point in there, we're gonna notice there's another door that leads to a dumb waiter that goes all the way up to the roof. And over on the roof, there's this little, beautiful little shack where you're going to spend the next 20 years. 
doors open doors open doors and you will never know about that other door in there until you go through the first door that beckons you all right next 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 all right here we go this is a good one this is a good one everybody's got a freaking opinion on this one and I don't claim to know it all, but um, I've written a two-volume book on this exact topic. So here we go. Carly asked the question. And by Carly, I do not mean Carly, our studio cat. Is Carly around here? <coughs> I'll take that as a yes. Uh, Carly, not our studio cat, is asking, do you think a couple can recover from an affair? All right. No sooner do I say that. And 70% of my audience has already registered the answer in their own head. But we're going to play with it as a uh, not answered fully yet question. That is, every couple is different. Okay. I'm going to tell you this. Do I think a couple can recover from an affair? Uh, which um, also is somewhat related to the question, will a cheater cheat again? Uh, it's related, but it's not the same question. Can a couple recover? Yes, absolutely. A couple can recover from cheating. It depends on two things. How motivated are the two individuals? How motivated? Because what so many people don't understand about infidelity, and like I said, wrote a two-volume book, I have cheated, I have been cheated on, and I have been the one cheating with someone who's cheating on their spouse. And I've actually done that one a number of times back in my uh, earlier life my younger years. And so I've got firsthand evidence and me being the question asker, I was always asking questions of people that I was involved in. And so I've seen inside the minds of cheaters, but also, and so I have it from firsthand experience. This isn't book knowledge shit, all right? This is the real shit. There are a few things in life that I feel very qualified to speak on, and one of them is infidelity. That what's driving the infidelity is not the problem in the relationship. The problems in the relationship are not created by the cheating and the cheating um, uh, is not caused by the problems in the relationship. It all goes back to unfulfilled needs 20, 40, 60 years ago back in fucking childhood. And you may think that's hokum and I quite frankly don't, don't give a shit. I've been doing this a long time and that's where it goes back to. Beliefs of I'm no good and so, and, or I'm not, I'm not uh, wanted, I'm not lovable that the real me doesn't matter. And people are like, what the fuck does that have to do with cheating? What the fuck that has to do with cheating is that if you're in a relationship where you're getting love and yet it's still not enough, and yet you're gonna go sleep with someone else or have an emotional affair with someone else, that indicates there's something fucking wrong with your love cup. That you're getting love poured in by a primary love source, all right? And, or maybe there's problems with that primary love source in your life, if that primary love source isn't yourself. Whatever it is, but you're getting love in your love cup, or even if there are problems, but it's not enough. Why? Because there's a hole in your fucking love cup. No matter how much you get, it's not enough. Or uh, you're all, you've always been wanting more. Whatever it is, it's because of, it's, been, it's been a damaged love cup your entire life. You think that happened in adulthood? Uh-uh. That happened way back there. And until that love cup is repaired, not just the hole in the bottom, but the fact that maybe it, it never got full, that all the love sources were always somewhere else, never around you pouring love in, right? Or maybe there was also crud put into your love cup as well. All sorts of crap, rocks and manure and stuff stuck into your love cup, all right? The problem is what's going on inside that fucking love cup and with the love cup. And if you don't repair that, and that shit goes back to college, uh, college childhood, if you don't repair that, there's no fucking chance for that relationship. All right. People will say, oh, my marriage or my spouse did blah, blah, blah. And so that's why I cheated. No, that's not why you cheated. Except in the rarest of cases where someone is using uh, cheating to escape abuse. Except in the rarest of cases, the, the cheating is not caused by the fucking relationship. That's a bullshit cop out. Okay. It's not. Period. All right, so can it be fixed is your question. Can a couple recover from an affair? Yes. What's blown is the trust, but that's not the essence of the problem. Uh, not just the essence of the problem, um, but both, both people have to go very, very deep. It's not just that the person who cheated has to go very deep and be in therapy. Who really needs therapy as well is the person who has cheated on because you need to get into the very depths of your feeling, the destruction of your trust, the destruction of your sense of worth. Feeling like all that love that they had been saying and giving all those years was just bullshit. 
and what that makes you think of yourself. If you're not going into your deep feelings, you ain't gonna heal shit for a relationship. You're just band-aiding shit. If you're in couples counseling, thinking that your real issue in repairing the relationship is the relationship, if you think couples counseling is gonna solve that fucking problem, unless you've got some just fucking genius couples counselor who can stir magic fucking potions in one hour, and it's never an hour, is it? It's 50 minutes, right? Or even in two hours, you know, once a week, no, because the, the issue is the individual's own relationship with their own individual self, the individual's own past shit. Two people need to be doing serious individual work before the couple's work is even fucking feasible. If, if, if you're going to a couple's counselor because someone cheated, it's just like, I mean, you can do it. And I, you know, there's probably some good gauze band-aids that you can put over shit, but the real shit is what's going on down deep. And so can a couple recover from an affair? Yes, but it is hard as fuck. And you gotta go fucking deep. And two people gotta commit to that hardcore, hardcore deep. And if you don't have a therapist that can take you deep, then two people gotta be committed to doing it each individually. And I've got tools. My tools are instructed, they're instructed, are created to take you deep. Even still, it's just like, that's a whopper. And can, can you recover? Yes, you can. Uh, but it's going to take some hardcore work. All right, next question. Hey, Sven, it's getting towards the uh, beginning of the year. And I wonder if we can talk a little bit about your new book, because a lot of the listeners ask about your books. And the latest one, it's great to start January 1st with the very first of the daily meditations, one for each day of the year. Looking forward to that. Well, thank you, Rob. I appreciate that. Yes, the book is out, Badass Wisdom, and available at uh, the uh, badasscounseling.com. And uh, many people have been reading it and loving it. And um, it's, uh, you know, it's just, if you get the audiobook version, for instance, um, there's a little bit of music that intros each episode and outtakes each episode. And there's usually a quote that starts each day, quote or two. And then uh, some sort of anecdote or insightful uh, thought and questions for you in your daily journaling or in your daily thought as you go through the day to be chewing on. And it's fucking deep and it's powerful and it's intense. Rob, you've been through the entire book. Yes, I have. And page by page. I have to journal it out after I've looked at all these things. Have to? Yeah. You hate it. I know. I love it. Okay. But you know, it's just so much to deal with. It's great. Uh, and uh, that's great. And Rob, you were in, uh, instrumental in the making, particularly of the audiobook, for which I am grateful. And as you, anybody who follows my podcast knows that if I didn't have Rob involved, that shit ain't coming to fruition. So miracles happen on my end. Yes. <laughs> you are the miracle maker. You are fucking Annie Sullivan yourself, uh, miracle worker. All right. All right. So that is Badass Wisdom. The book is available uh, most everywhere. And then the audiobook only at BadassCounseling.com. This show provides soul counseling intended to entertain and inform and is not medical advice. Now, back to the badass. Yes, we are back. And it's great to have you back. Funny after just saying that right now, Rob, First question that comes up, someone says, where can you buy your books from? Listen to us. Just listen. <laughs> Go to badasscounseling.com. Uh, they are all there. Badasscounseling.com. They're all there. All right. Next question. All right. Alaskan Girl says, do you narrate the book? I do. All of my books I narrate, except uh, we have the uh, Spanish version of Love Cup um, uh, on the way. In the pipeline, I do not narrate that because I do not speak Spanish. And trust me, that was a good decision. Um, so for if you have someone who uh, is a Spanish speaker and wants uh, Love Cup or you think they will benefit from Love Cup being uh, in, in Spanish, uh, please feel free to get that for them. Uh, it is up soon or up uh, on uh, badasscounseling.com. All right, here we go. Why do they discard you after they sabotage you? Um, you, without knowing any of the specifics of what you're talking about, um, I'm gonna, just going to take that as a generality and answer it. Why do they discard you after they sabotage you? If they're sabotaging you, um, they're either hurt by you. Well, they clearly want to hurt you. You sabotage things that you want to hurt, right? They want to hurt you likely because in their brain, 
in their brain, I'm not saying it's an absolute truth or even true at all, but in their brain, you've hurt them and they want to hurt you. And then uh, they discard you to hurt you further, but you've suited their purposes. And likely the reason they want to hurt you in the first place is because you're not doing what they want you to do, which is in all likelihood, give them love in some form or another. Give them attention, give them your money, give them your time, uh, do what they want you to do, serve them. And once you're no longer doing that, or once the, the doing of that comes with any sort of strings or strings that they don't want to pull, uh, things, you know, if you're wanting something in return and they don't want to do it, now what you're giving doesn't feel good. Now it's seen as per, perhaps a, uh, a betrayal, but they don't want to have to give for what they're getting. They just want to get. And so they're going to hurt you and discard you. But what's fascinating about your question, what's really fascinating about your question, Ryzen, is you ask, why do they discard you after they sabotage you? It's fascinating you wouldn't even, you're not asking about the sabotaging, you're asking about the discarding. Implying, I mean, why would you even ask that? Because it implies to me that you wish they hadn't discarded you. Why, you ask the question, why do they discard you after they sabotage you? You didn't ask, why do they sabotage you? You're asking about the discarding. And it sounds to me like the discarding hurts and you wish you hadn't been discarded. So what it really seems to be saying then is I'm almost okay with the sabotaging, but the discarding hurts and I wish they wouldn't. I would have allowed or you know, gotten past the sabotaging, but I'm really sad that they discarded me. And that's probably, if that is true, that's problematic. It's problematic for you because what you're fundamentally saying is that someone can hurt you, sabotage you, undermine you, and you still want to keep them. That's not good. From an internal sort of health, soul health perspective, that's not good. That you want to keep people. And it's not bad that you have those feelings of wanting them. Because sometimes, even when, let's say you're divorcing someone, any many divorced people will say, well, I still love my husband, but we can't be together now. Or, you know, I still love my wife, but I'm not in love with her anymore. Or we've grown toxic together. It doesn't mean, just because you want to leave someone doesn't mean you don't love them, okay? So when you say, you know, I wish they hadn't discarded me, and you didn't say that, but it feels like it's implied in what you're saying, um, in the discarding, that that's what's hurting is that they discarded you, that a part of you didn't want that. And on one hand, it's okay, that's normal. No one likes to be discarded and that hurts. And But if it's, I still want them back, well, that's a different issue from just having the feeling of wanting them back or having the um, feelings of love if you actually do want them back or if uh, you know that was somewhat actionable for you and you acted on that, well, then that's a separate issue because you're fundamentally saying that someone can hurt me and I'm still gonna let them be in my life, and that's not okay. That reflects a sense of self that doesn't think much of itself. That reflects a sense of uh, low self-worth that I would keep someone in my life who sabotages me. And where you wanna go with that is in your own healing is you wanna go inside and find out how you were taught about yourself to think so little of yourself that someone could mistreat you and you would still keep them in your life because that's the origin of you potentially still wanting to keep someone or still keeping someone in your life who is sabotaging you. And that, those root beliefs that you were taught about yourself, that that's how little worth you have, that's the stuff that needs to be rooted out. Otherwise, in the future, you will continue to allow people to sabotage or hurt you and you will keep them in your life. Uh, and that's not good. All right, next question, Rob. Yeah, this is one about uh, your authentic self, but it has a, a twist to it. This uh, listener asks, my son, who was in the sixth grade, has been writing school essays. His recent one was titled, I don't feel like I can be myself at school, but I can at home. How can I help him out with the school part? I want to tell you a story. And I may have told this once before. I was at a funeral of a very of the first girl I ever dated, uh, Missy Schroer. And she had passed away early. Uh, tragically, and I had known her father, I had worked for her th father at his store, Bob's Produce Ranch, and, um, and Missy had passed away, and I ran into an old classmate, and this classmate had told me the story growing up, and this particular person uh, was very much um, 
And I had to apologize for how I had treated this person in elementary school or uh, junior high and, uh, and, and acknowledge this person had gone through a lot of mistreatment. And this person said to me, Sven, you know, it's so funny you say that. You weren't one of the worst ones, Sven. I said, well, thank you, but I still know I did. And, and this person, you know, uh, forgave me. Um, and, uh, but went on to say this, Sven, when I was very young, I had a couple of older siblings and, uh, one of them at a very young age had been driving the family car and accidentally hit me with the car pulling into the driveway. And, uh, they rushed me to the hospital and I was in the hospital and, uh, I recovered and so forth. And fortunately there was no permanent damage, but this, and, and I was very, very young, Sven. And this older sibling felt such a horrible guilt, extreme guilt, that for the next 15, 17 years of my life, whatever it was, I was treated like royalty in my house by that older sibling. And like I, that sibling made sure I always had the best seat in front of the TV. And when it was time to turn the channel, if I wanted the channel change, my sibling would turn the channel, you know, back before the days of remote controls. And, uh, yeah, and I always ate first per the sibling. And I, my, that sibling always looked out for me and made sure no one hurt me. And that sibling did everything to make me feel like the absolute king of the world. And, and so this person went on to say, and so when I came to school, this person was one of, if not the most picked on bullied person in our entire school. And this person told me, and so Sven, when I would go to school, yeah, I was teased horribly and miserably. Um, but it, I gotta tell you, Sven, it rolled off me like water off a duck's back. I said, how can that be? And basically what this person told me is this story. And then, and to sum it up, this person was getting such a profound counter message at home such a profound and huge counter message at home that the shit at school didn't stick. Talk about the power of counter messaging. So you, you ask the question, to the person who asked the question up here on YouTube, to the person who asked the question, what can I do uh, when my son feels he can't be himself at school, um, continue to... Uh, in first of all, in very big ways, continue to give your child full access to their authentic self and encourage that. I was just watching a video recently. I don't very often watch uh, other people's stuff who are writers or sort of in my field, but I was watching something by Gary V. And he was saying this in his own parenting. He says, that is all that matters. I don't want this kid to be who I am. I don't want this kid to be some entrepreneur. I don't want this kid to da, 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 da. I just want this kid to be whoever the hell they are. And my job is to clear the path to help them become themselves. Okay, that's a big shot in the business world talking like that. And that's exactly it. You need to give your child full access to and full facilitation of their most authentic self. And if they want to try things, let them try it. If they want to quit things, let them try it. Let them quit it, all right? Um, in addition to that, well, then how do you deal with the school aspect? One, do you need to change schools? Two, do you need to isolate? Do you, you need to talk with your child and isolate the variable? What precisely is going on at school such that this child feels they can't be themselves? Now, the truth of the matter is all of us, when functioning in society, there's always going to be the bumping of elbows and the bruising of ribs. There's always going to be situations where to some degree we have to compromise ourselves. And especially when we're young, we want to be liked. We don't want to get teased. We don't want to be thought, you know, looked at sideways. And so we bend and contort to some degree. But the less that happens, the better, of course. But you want to isolate what the hell is causing this to happen. Now, if there is bullying going on, if there is significant teasing going on, that can be addressed and that can be taken to the school. But more importantly, the child needs to be given an avenue to talk about it. And I'm not saying you're not doing it. And if you are, God bless you, but keep letting the child talk. Teach your child. I think he said, they said sixth grade. Is that right, Rob? My son who was in the sixth grade. Right. Yes. By sixth grade, you're 12, roughly. My mother started me journaling when I was 13. One of the best things that ever happened to me. And she just said, just flush out everything you're feeling, flush out your day, write out what's happening, anything. This is yours. It's private and keep it private. Do not read your child's journals. But give that child an avenue to talk out their stuff. Maybe when they come home from school at the end of the day, just let them talk about their day. Ask them questions. Don't go in. Don't be fix it. 
Or you can ask him, do you want to be helped, heard, or hugged? Helped, heard, heard, or hugged. Okay. And, but l- default to heard, <laughs> even if they say helped, default to heard, just let them talk it out, flush it out, flush it out, flush it out. Um, and, and getting that out of their system. Maybe, maybe a change of schools, maybe a change of classrooms. Or also using this out as an opportunity to teach the child to modulate their own feelings to take their feelings and say, all right, so you're feeling that way during the day. And the truth is, son, there are gonna be times in life where you're not able to be your fullest self as part of life. And we all know that. Even for me, you know, Mr. Self-Expressed, you know, blah, blah, blah. There are times when I keep it in, you know? Or or I'm different aspects of my personality in different situations. There is some of that in life. So you're teaching your son that, but then taking those, but saying to him, so during the day, collect your feelings, start out, bring a bag, to school, metaphorically, and stick it, oh, in this moment, I'm feeling really pissed off that this person is saying this, or I'm feeling really sad. Stick it in that bag, stick it in the bag, stick it in the bag. And then during study hall, or when you get back home, start, unpack the bag. You're teaching this child how to get the rocks out of their back, how to get the crud out of their love cup. You're teaching them that we can't always do it right in the moment. We can't always express our feelings right in the moment. Put it in the bag, and we address it later. Go ahead, Rob. The listener comments here also, he is in counseling and he has his own journal. Excellent, excellent. And and uh, honoring the privacy of that and so forth. But if the child can be themselves at home, that's a huge thing. And kudos to you, dad, kudos to you, mom, or, or dad and dad, mom and mom, whatever, non-binary and non-binary, but kudos to whoever the hell is raising this child, uh, that they're letting it and, and facilitating it at home. Uh, but again, and doing what you can, you have a you have a job to isolate the problem spots and remove those problem spots if there are some at school, um, or if it's just a general feeling when you're at school, then that those need to be addressed with your child as well. And this is an opportunity for you to bond with your child as well. By the way, that to the degree you're comfortable uh, to telling me about it, Billy, tell me about you know what you're feeling today. What what happened at school today? Because otherwise he's he's saving it for that one week appointment with a therapist, right? But just tell me what happened at school today. Oh, nothing. Really? Okay. Whoa. Or, um, you know, ask open-ended questions. Get them talking. And then, and then just ask the question, what did that feel like? Or that must have been hard. Boy, if I were in that situation, I would have been frustrated. Was it frustrating? How did it feel for you? You know, and just get them talking. And they may not open up the fully the first time, but maybe the fifth time or the 15th time. And once they start opening up to a parent, boy, you've got gold right there. You've got gold because they have someone they can trust and they can lean on who's not always trying to fix them or change them. And they're going to need that. He's going to need that in the next year, the next two years, the next four years as he navigates those middle teens, which is which are so fucking hard, right? But don't use it as an opportunity to control him or exercise power over him or get him to be or do what you want him to be or do. Next question. Here we go. This is a good one. Over here on Facebook, how do you let go from toxic people? Like my mother, my ex-narc, I love them, especially my mother who I can't have the way I should, but it hurts. And how do I unlove my ex, LOL? Okay, first of all, uh, we'll, we'll work our way backwards. How do you unlove someone, so to speak? You flush out all the feelings. We let go of someone, you know, people always used to tell me, oh, you gotta let go of her, you know, you broke up, you gotta let go, you gotta let go. What the fuck does that mean? Just let go? I, that, that's just dumb advice. I mean, what does that even mean? And I tell people now, and I had to learn it the hard way by figuring out myself, that we uh, let go by holding on as tightly as you can. Hold on as tightly as you can. Hold on to all those feelings and write them out. I would write letters. And back then, the reason I always tell you guys, write these letters and don't send them. Write the letters because I used to send them. <laughs> the humiliation of that and not getting the love you want or that being used against you to then, you know, being held to all sorts of shit and, and uh, yeah, don't send them. The goal isn't the sending to change them or try to win them back. The goal is the flushing of how you really feel. Don't send them. And, but flush out all of those feelings. That's how you unlove someone, by allowing all the feelings that you feel, wearing the favorite t-shirt of theirs, going for that walk in that park that you used to love to go to walks on together. Keep going back there and allow all those feelings and memories to come up. And if you can bring a journal with you, bring a journal with you. Until eventually when you're going to that park, it doesn't have that emotional charge of that person. You don't equate it with that person. Go to that favorite bar you used to love to go to together where you'd play darts. Go there. I used to fucking journal on cocktail napkins. I've journaled on freaking 
placemats. I've journaled on articles, clothing. I used to journal on my hand if I didn't have anything. I'd journal anywhere, man. If I was had a feeling, flush it out, flush it out, flush it out. All right, that's how you unlove someone. But then back to your earlier question, um, how do you let go from toxic people like my mother and this uh, ex narc Well, that's how you let go. And some people will say, well, just focus on the bad. Then the hate will help you move on. Yeah, yeah, hate's not a real, it can be a powerful motivator, but it's not the kind of shit you want to be using as fuel because then what you're fundamentally saying, I mean, if you need fuel in your, ga in your gas tank to make your car go, you're constantly needing more fuel, right? Well, if your hatred of that person or focusing on all your anger at that person is what keeps you from wanting them back, then you're gonna need more of that and you're gonna need more of that and you're gonna spend your time focusing on the hatred and the anger and all the at them. So you're gonna need to focus on bad to keep a person out of your life. Why the hell would you wanna spend your life focusing on bad? What if you were to do just what I just got done saying, and that is I'll focus on the bad, focus on the good, focus on the love, focus on all of it and flush it and flush it, not retain it, not hold it. The purpose of journaling is not to capture thoughts, it's to release feelings and thoughts. But to flush it, flush it, flush it till eventually it's not there. That's how you release toxic people or anybody else. By flushing out all the feelings. All righty. I think you just got a two for one there. Another uh, listener says, uh, I've been married to a mean addict. I'm about to leave. How do I say strong? I think you just answered that yeah, question. Yeah, that makes total sense. Let's take this one. Kim asked the question here on Tiki Talkie. Asked the question. How do you think about the far distance love? Okay, I'm going to Take this to mean long distance relationships. It's funny you bring that up because um, I literally did an article on that. It's on the website. It went out in our September or October newsletter uh, that we send out for everyone who's uh, signed up for the newsletter on the website, badasscounseling.com. I did a quite a piece on long distance relationships um, and I've actually been published on long distance relationships in the past. I don't know what the hell happened to those articles. Maybe they're on the website. My webmaster would know that stuff. Um, but... Um, I've been in them, okay? And long distance relationships, basically what you're asking, how do I feel about or what do I think about long distance relationships? They can be fantastic and they can be horrible. Uh, a lot of military clients of mine and friends that I had from when I was uh, you know, at the Air Force Academy and so forth um, have to deal with long distance relationships, whether they're deployed or whether they're out at sea for six months at, for the Navy folk or longer. Um, it can be wonderful and it, it brings its own set of challenges. Um, but the, the biggest thing that I've found that has to be tackled is trust. At the root of any great relationship is trust, but especially at the root of long distance relationship. And I'm not even talking about cheating, really, it, because our brains always go there. Are they cheating? Are they not cheating? Well, what's at the root of that? In other words, do I trust that this person truly loves me? That's the even deeper issue. Because, you know, when it, Rob and I interact, we see each other, you know, a couple times a week, uh, but we're also friends and, you know, uh, and uh, we have mutual friends. And so when I see Rob, you know, it's the usual looks and the banter and so forth. And that confirms, confirms I love you, you love me as friend, right? That it's the daily stuff that is constantly confirming the value of the other person, the value to me. And so if I'm not getting that daily stuff, those daily confirmations aren't always there. So it's harder for me to believe or trust or know, do they really love me? And that's the question, one of the core fundamental questions of all uh, of life. Do they really love me? Am I loved? Which of course lead, is the tied in with the question, am I lovable? Uh, and so the, the challenge is, do I trust this person? Do I trust that they love me? Um, do they trust that I love them? Do they know? And at the root of that, and I, I think it's such a cliche, but I'm gonna say it anyway, is, is a type of communication, what's being communicated. And, and it's so important with long distance relationships, not just, gee, we communicate, we talk and we have you know phone sex and we talk about each other and we uh, or talk to each other all the time, tell us about our date. No, 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 it's gotta be the deeper shit. It's the content of the communication. Are we truly discussing our fears? Not just the financial worries or not just, you know, um, when are we gonna see each other next time? Are we talking about our fears? Are we talking about our aspirations? Are we talking about our dreams? Are we talking about our fears? And are we talking about our fears? That's at the essence of long 
distance relationships is the trust and the fears and they have to be talked about everything boy in any if there's ever a relationship that needs shit on the table it's long distance relationships it all has to be on the table and we got to be on the same page because uh, that thing can fray so quickly all right um did we cover them all rob i think you got it and i enjoy our daily interactions because you laugh at my bad jokes i think you have great jokes very grateful for that uh, response from you (laughs) well i wouldn't be laughing unless they were good jokes so the characterization as bad jokes makes no sense to me does not compute Excellent. All right. So for those of you who have been tuning in around the world to this lightning round of the Badass Counseling Show, thank you so much for joining us. We love having you here. We love your questions that you send in. And for anyone wanting to be counseled uh, on the counseling episodes of the Badass Counseling Show, if you would like to counsel with me, please write into production at badasscounseling.com. That is production at badasscounseling.com and send a one paragraph description of what you're struggling with. And my producers, they go through that and they pick out the ones that are going to be on the show and it's free. And uh, if you wanna be anonymous, you can be anonymous. Uh, Just don't be late for dinner. All right, thank you for tuning in. And to everyone around the world, on behalf of KC over in the booth and Rob right here next to me, have a kick-ass day. The Badass Counseling Show is strictly copyrighted. No copies may be made without the express written consent of the Badass Counseling Show, LLC. The Badass Counseling Show is produced by Karen Camparelli and Robert H. Friedman. Executive producer, Sven Erlinson. Original music by two-time Emmy Award-winning composer, Trevor Morris. Have a kick-ass day. Hey.